And we are back. The Natural Awakening Podcast with me, your host, Wiston. Today's guest, Sasha. I don't know how to pronounce your last name. Chapin. Chapin. Sasha Chapin. Um, so I asked uh, on Twitter and, and elsewhere for who should I interview next? And your name come up came up from some friends and some people that I that I work with one on one as hey, you should talk to Sasha. And we had um uh one or two conversations um, recently that were, were fun, I think, for, for both of us. So seemed like a good idea. And here we are. Um, yeah. And for me, I think this is mostly going to be fun in a, kind of a get to know you kind of exercise, because while I've, I've read things you've written um, a couple of times before, I don't actually know that much about your background. And maybe some other folks don't either. So um, if it's all right with you, uh, I'd like to start just with some basic, you know, biographical info. Where were you born? You know, maybe give us a sense um, in however much detail you like what your kind of early childhood was like at that that t- time. Were there any religious, spiritual, meditative things going on? Um, anything that would be relevant later on for the bulk of the discussion, which is going to be meditation. How, you know, how how did you get into this? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, how do we get into this mess? Good question. <laughs> Record scratch. You might be wondering how I ended up here on the Natural Awakening <laughs> exactly. broadcast. Uh, so I was born in Toronto uh, in 1988. Um, so I am approaching middle age. Uh, I had a pretty lousy early childhood, I would say. My parents are extremely good people, but they were under a lot of financial and personal stress at the time when I was a child um, and I was severely bullied when I was a kid. And I was one of those kids who was entertaining low grade suicidal ideation at like 11, 12. Um, Me too. Rough. (laughs) Part of the club. Yeah, it really sucked. And there was some spiritual material around when I was a kid. My dad did Tai Chi and he had a copy of the Tao Te Ching's first page pasted to our kitchen wall. So those were ideas that were in the air and probably bled into my early intellectual development, such as it was. But he wasn't a formal practitioner in a sit-down sense. And I was inculcated in a very hippie-ish brand of Taoism-influenced Judaism, which I didn't really take to. Um, so fast forward. Um, I was a misfit teen who got into all sorts of trouble, not like legal trouble, just interpersonal trouble of various kinds, psychological trouble. And in my early 20s, I think I was 20, I took an amazing course on Buddhist psychology, the University of Toronto with Tony Toniato, who is an undersung quiet force in the Buddhist community. I think lots of people take that course and are blown away by it. I think there was a full on Kensho moment. I witnessed just via his extremely forceful verbal distillation of Buddhist principles, like the first day. Um, really, wow. really great. Teacher. Yeah, that can happen sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, really great, passionate teacher. And so I started meditating I was also really influenced by Brad Warner's books and thereafter DT Suzuki and the Zen tradition appealed to me aesthetically. My brother got into that stuff and I got into that stuff as a direct result. So via that confluence of forces, I started meditating quite seriously. And should I just continue on this? Yeah. Well, I'm curious, like what, what, what that meant for you at that time, what, what did quite seriously look like? Were you going on session? Were you practicing in a community? Had you committed to a teacher or what, what did that look like? I didn't commit to a teacher or go on session, uh, which I think was to my disadvantage in my recent practice. It's really helped to have an a la carte relationship with several teachers and to not be committed to a tradition. That's really helped me in particular. At the time I was just prideful and shy in combination. Um, And so I just took it upon myself to have a serious practice. And basically unbeknownst to me at the time, I really didn't like myself and enlightenment just seemed like a way to not be myself anymore. And so (laughs) 
I had this very grindy practice about an hour a day sitting, sometimes divided into chunks, sometimes not, and walking practice and lots of off the cushion speculating. But it was really me developing a greater and greater skill level at disassociation, um, uh, which did not serve me well. Um, for that reason, yeah, others, my mental. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I wasn't tackling the one thing that turned out to be most vital in my practice, which is my tendency towards emotional avoidance. Um, and for that and other reasons, my mental health spiraled and eventually I swore off meditation. I managed to find a really gifted psychiatrist and I started making progress in my life. And, um, my childhood dreams of becoming a somewhat celebrated, locally celebrated writer started coming true. I got a book deal. Things started looking up for me and I, I basically mentally relegated meditation to my past. I said, well, that was a waste of time. And now I'm doing what I should be doing. Uh, and so I had this weird practice history with a very strong initial commitment and then a sudden drop off for a few years. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what got you back into it? So you, you had this, um, I mean, you're still a writer. That's, that's far as I know, that's, that's kind of your, your main thing. You have several things, but that's, that's one of the main ones. Yeah. Um, how, how did that go um, until you picked up meditation again and what brought you back? Well, again, there was a confluence of factors. Sometimes it's good to achieve your childhood dreams and find out that they won't make you happy. Um, so I got a book deal and I put out a book and I secured a wife and I was living in LA, which was always my dream growing up in Toronto. Uh, and my mental health was pretty good, but I just wasn't happy. Um, uh, and then, uh, a couple things happened. My wife, first wife was, um, I now have a second wife. Uh, my first wife was deep into spirituality and she introduced me to transcendental meditation. I thought, okay, this seems like a pretty lightweight practice, pretty relaxed. And so I started building up some gentle shamatha through that. Uh, I think the TM organization sucks, but the basic technique of super, super relaxed mantra based meditation is a really nice intro practice for neurotic yeah. cerebral people often. Uh, and then I had an experience with a book called Existential Kink. I've written about this before. Uh, I've, I've heard a bunch of people mention this book. I haven't weighed it in myself. Maybe I should give it a go, but but please go on. It is a cringy New Age book written by someone who believes in magic with a K and sells extremely expensive courses on the internet. <laughs> and at the same time, it is a treasure trove of psychological insights. And the central practice in it is a sort of judo throw. Now I recognize some elements of it in Vajrayana practice. I didn't have sure. that understanding at the time. Where, I can imagine. Vajrayana yeah, is kind of kinky. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I've heard that. Um, you, um, in the practice, for anyone who's curious about it, it's worth reading the book. But just for the sake of this discussion, basically you um, – Think of a situation in your life that you were ashamed of, some maladaptive behavior where you wonder, why am I doing this? And then you fully take ownership of it, specifically by trying to enjoy the somatic sensation of it that comes up in yeah. your body. And you yeah. tell yourself, oh, it would be so bad if I enjoyed this. It would be so oh, bad. Oh, no, so naughty. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's sort of the kind of hedonic flip that happens for some people during BDSM activity, yep. hence the name yep. of the book. Uh, I think my first time doing that was the first really good meditation sit of my life. And I could actually feel chunks of my self-perception come off. The mm -hmm, results mm -hmm. were immediate. Um, my first wife had been sometimes frustrated by how cerebral I was and how anchored I was to stories and a certain ego image of myself that I built up over a long period of time. Immediately thereafter, I became much more 
in the world, less looking at the world, more directly relating to people around me. Um, so this was really good. And it was a real update to my world model. I had gone to dismissing meditation as a way to cope with pain via dissociation. And all of a sudden I had this experience where I was having greater intimacy with the world moment to moment via this one weird trick. Yeah. Yeah. No, definitely. Um, yeah, I won't go into it, but yes, <laughs> you, you will find very similar things in Vajrayana, including, you know, in extraordinarily um, and vividly sometimes violent uh, imagery practices that you engage um, with kind of vigor and glee um, it, in a way that would seem totally counterintuitive. And yet um, that liberates afflictive emotion into, um, well, awakened awareness and recognition of emptiness. That's That's how it goes. <laughs> Absolutely. At this point, I see one dimension of the contemplative path as just reducing fragmentation, um, rejecting less and less and less, clinging onto less and less and less, less and less mentally saying this, not that. And mm -hmm. I think at the gross level, rather than just doing shamatha or vipassana, often the more direct path is to just stare the obvious stuff, the obvious shadow behavior in the face and say, hey, maybe <laughs> I like this. <laughs> Why do I keep doing this? There, because there's something there. There's, there's something there or you wouldn't be doing it. Yeah, exactly. Um, really cool methodology. And I, I recommend that book a lot. And it's one of these books that's very high variance. 80% of people throw it across the room for 20% of people. It is a life changing <laughs> power tool. So Super cool. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, where, where from there, uh, existential kink, um, how, how far did you go with that? And then what next teachers, so was, texts, practices? That was powerful. And just because of how surprising it was, I became really obsessive about starting to notice my own mind and trying to apply existential kink at a more and more micro level. Every time there was a sensation, I felt myself flinching away from my thought. Oh, yeah. cool. This inappropriate attraction. Awesome. This being <laughs> another opportunity. By somebody, great. And that was productive. Um, at the same time, I met this guy, Mark Estefanos, Estefanos, I never know how to pronounce his name, uh, who is an introspection coach who does, I would say, IFS influence stuff. And I mentioned my experience to him and he said, oh, yeah, that happens all the time with shadow integration. To which I responded, what are you talking about? And excuse me? <laughs> yeah, pardon. And sign me up. And so I did some sessions with him that gave me more of an IFS parts frame, um, which was useful at times. And then uh, I moved to the desert with my first wife. We were in Joshua Tree. And I happened to encounter the tweets of Nick Camerata and Tashin Fogelman and Michael Taft and a couple of other people. And if I had encountered their stuff a year earlier, I think I would have dismissed it as hippie nonsense. <laughs> Given when it arrived in my life, I was very excited about seeing what they were talking about. And I had a call with Nick. By the way, I, I know that Nick Camerata can be a controversial figure sometimes. I would say that in my personal interaction with him, he has been immensely generous with his time with the only apparent motive being to help me suffer less. So, um, likewise for what it's worth. I mean, I've, I've been back and forth with Nick for years and he has been nothing but lovely. Um, and I can claim some responsibility for turning him on to Jonas. That's, 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 I, Oh, cool. I, so I can, you, I can, you I, it's my fault. It's Jonas. my fault. I, you got this whole thing going. <laughs> when, when, um, when he was, when he was first getting interested, he was like, are these real on Twitter? I happened to be on Twitter at that time. And I was like, yeah, yep. Yep. Uh huh. <laughs> Cool. So I'm, I'm just now learning that uh, I am in your John lineage. Um, <laughs> well, you get it from Lee. You know, I get it for Ron Berbea and, and Lee and, uh, well, a bunch of places, actually. But anyway, it's cool. partially my fault. <laughs> great. Uh, great, great, great. Very good. So Nick had a call with me one night that was memorable for me where he said, well, you can probably get John if you can concentrate for 30 seconds. And I said, no fucking way I can do that. And he was like, have you tried lately? And I was like, maybe I should try. And what I found out, which was really surprising, surprising then, not surprising now, this 
integration shadow work had naturally improved my powers of concentration quite a bit. This moment to moment self-conscious filtering of experience was responsible for my perception that I had ADD or some attentional issue. And then I could suddenly concentrate. And then within a week I started hitting Jhana. another moment of joyful confusion for me. Um, and I started diving deep into Berbea and Taft. And then I started stumbling across the non-dual side of things more and more often. Mm-hmm. For me, the jhana kick was really productive. I didn't master them all. I got to pretty good speaking terms with like J5, J6, occasionally mm-hmm. touching J7 and 8, but not not in a super systematic, like Urbea level mastery kind of way. You, you didn't learn to enter into Nirodha Samapati for four hours straight? I mean, honestly, Sasha. Super shameful, I know. Um, I was making, but I was making rapid progress. I think living in the desert was a big part of it, honestly, as well as my renewed zeal for the Dharma. Because when you live in the desert, you have an uneventful life. Even if you're working at night, you can just stare up at the Milky Way, contemplate the universe. That's the best activity to be doing. Um, there's like a local saloon. It's fine. It has like four beers on tap, but you know, you probably just want to sit in your hot tub and meditate and look at the Milky Way. Um, nice. Yeah, super nice. And but I think for some people within a certain amount of time with jhana practice, the jhanas can start to seem buzzy and kind of constrictive. Like, mm-hmm. ooh, yeah, they're agitating buzzy. compared yeah, to. Exactly. Yeah. Well, compared to what? So let's move on to the to the what. <laughs> to the what? To the what? Um, that was also my question. Um, one thing that started happening with jhana practice and the shadow experiences, which, which kept happening on finer and finer levels. I started having transitory moments of something like non-dual awareness. And I was like, huh, maybe that's what well, these people were talking about. <laughs> maybe, maybe I should explore that. Um, and so I started doing nothing practice, doing do nothing practice. Um, very but with Shinzen's instructions, Michael Taft's some, a some combination mixture. of both. I continue to find that do nothing practice has a wealth of nuances because it's almost never that I'm doing exactly nothing. <laughs> There's almost always some subtle direction of experience, and if you're so actually I, doing nothing, might might you know that's that's some that's some quality non dual practice right there or non meditation. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. But it I, I think I've only started to really get there like this year. Um it's it's pretty difficult to do nothing. It's one of the weird things about it. Um just habit, you know. Strong habit. Yeah, definitely. You've been rewarded for doing things your whole life. Why would you stop now? Yeah. Um so Taft videos, Shinzen videos. Zen stuff. Um, Any Zen teachers in particular, or what, what were you reading? What were you listening to? Uh, Henry Shukman. Um, okay, yeah. Found Love him Henry Shukman. Excellent. And his Koan course on the Waking Up app was great. Um, One Blade of Grass, excellent. Highly recommend people read if you haven't. Very good. Very, very good. Um, and I, I, I started noticing that the phrase original face was psychoactive for me. It, it remains mm-hmm. so. Um, just, just little bits of the Zen literature that I was absorbing in a loving, but somewhat dilettante way. Um, yeah, sure. and so one day I had to drive from California to Northern Arizona for a really stupid reason. Um, my first wife and I bought a house, we were renting a house, but then we decided to get a house in the desert. And, um, for insurance reasons, we need to install a baseboard heater and they don't sell those in Southern California because why would you? So I had to drive to Arizona and back. And I was like, okay, this is the drive when I'm going to figure out non-self. I am going to do it today. <laughs> uh, it was a 14-hour drive. And uh, I spent the whole time in intensive meditation. And then at hour 13.5, I was listening to a Rob Berbea tape. Just kind of, it was on the in the background. Um, but I happened to tune in when he said, try imagining yourself as radiant emptiness or try to imagine yourself as radiant and empty. And uh, all of a sudden, my self-other boundary popped out of existence and never came back. 
uh, which is a cool experience. Yeah. Sometimes, you know, what, what do they say? Uh, insight is always an accident. Practice makes you accident prone. Yes, absolutely. Um, sneaks up on you and then there's no you. <laughs> yeah, it sneaks up on you. And I think Adi Shanti said something one time about the ego is like a pair of shoes you have to wear out. Um, in some way, you just get tired. Of yeah, no, you realize well, this yourself. doesn't feel so good anymore. And <laughs> yeah. And so often periods of intense practice for me have that character. Some level of my mind is grinding. And then via that grinding, that level of mind decides to stop. But I couldn't have yep. skipped right there. No, I couldn't have intended that stoppage in advance. No, it has nothing to do with intention at all. Um, you know, the, the conscious self can't will itself out of existence. It, uh, it won't work. <laughs> I speak yeah. from experience. I'm yeah. trying real hard. It doesn't, doesn't work that way. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's so strange. Eliminating the self as a project of the self doesn't work. And yet, the, the, the self until, you know, the, the... I mean, there are different models of mind you could, you could employ here. Um, yeah. But the subconscious structures which form the solidified, calcified self-identity eventually get informed enough <laughs> through, mm -hmm. through practice um, and experience to let go, which is not a conscious volitional process. Um, yeah, totally cosigned. Um, and then I I don't know I about the path model for that stage. I didn't find terms like stream entry to be descriptive of any one thing that happened at the time. Um, I know Michael Taft has a map of non-duality that's two stages: non-dual one, yeah, non-dual one, other... non-dual two. Yeah, I don't remember the nuances. Um, so I guess that was non-dual one. And then another thing happened within the next couple of months with Chiz. I had my first cessation experience and my first experience of really finely grained clinging, which is another one of those mm -hmm. pardon me moments when you realize you've been <laughs> doing that thing your whole life. Are you um, telling me that I have been clenching my fist <laughs> my whole life and I've never noticed? I've been yeah. holding this hot coal? No one told me? Yeah. Fuck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um... And I've been narrating for a while. Do you have questions? Any directive input? No, no, you, 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 you keep on going. I'm interjecting as, as appears appropriate. You, you cool. keep on rolling. Cool. So <clears throat> among other things, the opening made me realize that uh, my first marriage was not a good idea. We benefited from each other in various ways. And spirituality is a gift that in some sense, my first wife gave me. And I will, I can't repay that debt. Um, we just weren't suited for each other as long-term partners and we got divorced and um, that marked a new stage in my practice because I was forced to look at layers of emotion and insecurity um, that I just hadn't before. Mm. And then Michael Taft's work that sort of Vajrayana influenced about emotion was super valuable. Just long mm -hmm. hours spent ingesting the pain and ingesting the weird vigor of that time and um seeing my self-narrative come apart in real time and going like wow look at how that thing crumbles isn't that interesting <laughs> um ah oh, this all, all of these fragile empty fabrications look at them go yeah yep. they're yeah. there they keep going <laughs> i think too um there was a period of time in there that i Regret in happenstance, but it was really useful. Um, against everyone's advice, I immediately started doing a bit of dating uh, when I got out of the divorce. Usually and not advised. <laughs> usually not advised. And I think we, we've talked about this a little bit. Serious practitioners can delude themselves about their level of perfection and relational skill because they can make drugs happen in their mind whenever they want to. They can feel really good and feel really equanimous while leaving wreckage around them. And it's oh, not yeah. like I destroyed anyone's life. Everyone in those situations is fine now. And on the whole, we're on good terms. But um, I just really noticed within about six weeks of doing relation unskillfully, like, huh, my <laughs> my spiritual journey is definitely not complete here. And in fact... 
in fact, I probably need to wade into the remaining shadow aspects of my behavior. Um, Karmic traces, some scars, as they are known in the literature. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a there's a lot of them. There's a lot of uh, cleaning up, uh, emptying the basement to be done. Yep, yep, totally. And there is still. Um, so this is one interesting thing. I don't think we've discussed. I really like Daniel Ingram's writing about technique in the later paths and the phenomenology of it, and Roger Thisdell's work in this area. Mm -hmm. But in my case. None of those things have come about as a result of looking for that phenomenology. It appears mm -hmm. that mostly my progress is gated on emotional stuff, on noticing finer and finer layers of emotional clinging. And then as I do that, one day I'm like, huh, I appear to be centerless now. That's interesting. Um, <laughs> now, it's possible that that wouldn't happen if I didn't know about that phenomenology in advance that there's some combination of emotional work and scripting. But I just think that's an interesting thing. Um, during those post-divorce months when I was reflecting on my regrettable behavior and confronting my emotions, a lot of stuff kept happening phenomenologically. Uh, right. In terms of deeper and deeper non-duality, sense of time dropping away, sense of identity mm -hmm. dropping away at a more fine-grained level. How space these days? Uh, It is a constituent property of phenomena itself. Does that make sense? I mean, you you might have to go into a little more fine grained detail, and we don't have to go into it. Um, I'm that was that was that was a because there there is a certain point past which uh, there the normal relations of like space and time just are not present in the way that they used to be, and it sounds like that is there somewhat. <laughs> yeah, it's increasingly the case for me. So one really exciting thing for me is that last year, after more and more of this closet cleaning and more and more sitting, um, I had an insight that felt so fundamental and so liberating that I was like, cool, I, I basically hit the end here. And now it's just going to be more refinement. And if it indeed was that way, I would have been satisfied, which is the the getting the cosmic joke moment of, oh, I've, I've been looking for this thing that's right here all along. And yeah. Whoops. Whoops. Yeah. yeah. But the nature in here is in even my clinging. Um, I've never been alone for my whole life. Uh, uh, amazing. That was such a great moment. Um, and I talked to some teachers about it and they seemed to verify like, yep, you've had a really powerful insight. Who knows if this is the end or not, but it seems pretty promising. I was like, cool. Mm -hmm. cool. Well, there's no end. I mean, if any sure. teacher tells you, congratulations, you've reached the end. Um, excuse me? <laughs> but it, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't like that. Nobody said that, but more like this is the, this is the foundational insight. This is the big one. Yep. And after yep. this, it's refinement and skillful behavior, which is as yep. much of a task as any contemplative activity, strictly speaking, but in, in a certain sense, I mean, this is how it's phrased in, in, in the Rinzai tradition, uh, for example, like in, in strict kind of orthodox Rinzai Zen, like, great, you have a deep and abiding Kensho Satori. Um, and maybe even the sense of separate self has gone away and will never come back. Okay, this is the beginning. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now you have now to you take up the exhaustive post-awakening practice of benefiting all living beings with all of your activities 24 hours a day for the rest of your life until you die. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. I've merged with the field. Man, the field needs a lot of work. Field in rough shape. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, and then we started talking because recently something else happened. Um, my good friend Katie Devaney's uh, diagnosis of this is you had a full-on head awakening and now your gut is sort of catching up. It's happening mm -hmm. more on the body level. Um, that could be a rough transition, speaking from uh, some personal experience. It can be really unpleasant. <laughs> I've really loved it so far. Um, it happened was about two months ago. I was noticing that my relationship with my second wife and some other people was suffering from the fact that I was subtly rejecting loneliness, which was interesting to me because I thought... I was on speaking terms with all of my emotions, but there was just some subtle 
I shouldn't feel this. Very, very no. finely grained, very subtle. And I had a sit where I was trying to get as intimate as possible with the rejection, just the kind of thing I might do during a normal practice, sit with my affect, try to get intimate with it, not reject, open, open, open. And something happened. It was like, I've seen a movie and I forget which one it was. This is a visual trope that exists in multiple places, I'm sure. It was almost like I have this tiny puzzle piece and I put it into this big puzzle and then all of the puzzle lines disappeared. All the lines mm -hmm. in the puzzle and it became a holism. And yeah, yeah, yeah. my sense of agency dropped away on a radical level. It already dropped yeah. away somewhat, but... Yeah, there are gradations of this thing. Yeah, and I had this walk where I was just like, oh, no people, no things, just God moving around. Uh, <laughs> isn't that lovely? And that came and went over the couple, the next couple of days, and I, I appear to be in the process of integrating there, like I'm sort of wading deeper into that pool, or um, I approach that for a period of time, and then some layer of my psyche has a little bit of a problem with it, and then I interface with that level Wait, of my psyche. Hold on. There's no agency here or anywhere. There never was. Hmm. That's that's an update. <laughs> yeah. Um, I find that I have a corny personal saying, which is that ego death is amazing, but ego dearth is kind of rough. And I found <laughs> for 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 me, and maybe this speaks to what you said about gut level awakening being a rougher process sometimes. When I'm around the periphery of these really big updates and I can see them coming, it's often when attachment wounds start coming up and child parts yep. are coming up and um, the deep historical reasons why some part of you might be inclined to hold yeah, on. No, the, the deepest psychological wounds, which are core to your, your whole personality structure and any and all coping strategies you've ever adopted. Uh, yep, those, those, will, those will arise. <laughs> those will become clear. <laughs> yeah. So now I'm at this weird point where there are days at a time when the sense of agency is more or less gone. Everything is luminous and self-presenting and um, the power of the Dharma is overwhelmingly clear. And then there are days that are less like that, but I'm just trying to roll with it, you know? That's, that's all that anyone can do. That's all that anyone is doing, in fact, all the time. <laughs> so you say. <laughs> so I am increasingly convinced of. Yeah. yeah. So that's the, that's the entire history. The entire history. Well, that was that was great. Thanks for thanks for sharing. Um, unsurprisingly, uh, this is your you do this for a living. You're a wonderful storyteller. Thanks for thanks for spinning the yarn. Oh, my pleasure. Um, um, it is <laughs> it's wonderful to be able to talk about it in such self indulgent uh, borderline masturbatory detail. <laughs> but hey, you know, I that's we're we're here. You know, I'm not going to say something vulgar. Never mind. <laughs> Cool. Um, uh, okay, so is there anything more you want to say on the, the personal, impersonal end of things regarding your own practice? Anything we didn't touch that you think would be relevant or good for people to hear? Um, Two things. Um, an indefatigable guide to meditation process for me has been, how can I be better to my wife and friends? Oh, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No better teacher than that right there. <laughs> How am I showing up in all of my relationships? <laughs> yeah. I think people read these great texts by Ingram and Chuladasa and stuff, and they're totally wonderful in terms of illuminating how deep this territory is. But at the same time, you can sort of get caught up, and I have gotten caught up with meditation as a cerebral act and the act of producing more and more interesting things in your mind. But um, not only has that been the less productive approach for me in terms of relationships. It's actually been the faster vector for progress to focus on mm -hmm. being a kinder person. Um, Absolutely. The other thing I would say is, um, while I'm on the soapbox about practice history, one thing I skipped over uh, while I was getting into TM and getting back into practice, I read up on the Enneagram and understanding my Enneagram type was another major plus for my practice. Um, I think 
Um, one area in which the Buddhist tradition, at least the pragmatic one, as it's been translated, one area in which it's weaker is the helpfulness of depth psychology. And I think it's very helpful in that different people have dramatically different patterns of clinging that are often, um, and I, I feel like you agree with me here. And and sometimes you you'll listen to it. No, it's it's true. About, and and in fact, yeah. in the in in the you know early systematize the systematizing efforts of you know the Buddhist community in the Abhidhamma, they yeah. have an exhaustive personality typology, um, like really exhaustive that is just not well known, and people don't teach from it. But like no 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 no, they, they these guys thousands of years ago, um, <laughs> they they made an exhaustive personality typology with a lot of different subtypes and had specific recommendations for different practices at different times in different phases for different personalities and it's not well known but You're it exists it's in the abhidhamma nobody told me about this and um i mean i don't I, know it i haven't studied it but I've, yeah. i i i know that it's there i've looked at it <laughs> cool i would love to compare it to the enneagram um and so one thing that was a problem for me in my early practice was reading spiritual memoirs and hearing about other people's experiences of clinging and what, what's helpful for other people. And then unless your shadow sides and unless your personality structure is made really clear to you, I think almost everything you absorb about how to progress on the, how to, how to move forward with the path can be co-opted by that personality structure. Unless you really oh, yeah. intimately understand oh, yeah. it. Spe speaking as a formerly Olympic level spiritual bypasser uh, who represses uh, most negative emotion. Um, yeah. Yes, that. <laughs> yeah, totally. So I think for anybody who's at any stage on the path, um, getting into the Enneagram and understanding your type and understanding other people's um, personality structures could be really fruitful. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. No, I should have listened to my spouse earlier trying to get me into the Enneagram and uh, and paid more attention. I didn't, uh, you know, suffering. Um, oh, well, <laughs> better now. <laughs> um, you said something about repressing emotion. Are you a seven, too? Mm, it's been a while since I took the test. I think I'm type nine wing one. Um, is that to that? It's been a while. I, I could be wrong. My memory is not to. Uh, that Not tracks. Flawless. Sevens and nines are both uh, delusive types who try to make everything okay via different forms of dissociation. Oh yeah, um, no, definitely. And and practice, boy, it it can do that. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, one of my, uh, I was going to say enlightening. Perhaps we should use that word in a more specialized way during this conversation. Um, an illuminating experience for me was seeing over time how do nothing practice could either be the most sterile and life-denying form of meditation or the most intimate, enriching, enlivening form, yeah. um, depending on sometimes invisible to the practitioner differences in the overall spirit of application. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, eventually, like, if, you, if you're really committed to kind of do-nothing practice, I mean, it, it's 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 kind of training you to become sensitive to the spon spontaneity of your nervous system. Um, so, something that is often the, probably the most common misinterpretation of the technique is that you are meant to suppress um, urges that come up to direct your attention. Um, no, <laughs> or yeah. you're meant to actively monitor, like a like a cat watching a mouse hole, for intentions to direct your attention and stamp them out. I mean, you could do that, but that's that's not the technique as Shinzen teaches it, certainly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and eventually, if you become really sensitive to that kind of spontaneous self-organizing behavior, um, that just becomes the default. And that expresses in, you know, using traditional Buddhist terms in acts of body, speech, and mind. It is just that spontaneous self-organizing dynamic activity that then that's that's your life. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh... A couple months into that being more and more the case, uh, seems good. I like seems, it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. No complaints. Yeah. Um, any, anything we've missed or should I move on to audience questions?
No, I would say I am. Well, I want to take this opportunity to say I'm just tremendously grateful for the distributed Dharma community it is so cool. I think sometimes people talk about how, you know, in the past it was so much easier to wake up because it was a different time. And now we live in a spiritually deprived age. The fact that I can just send an email to Michael Taft, uh, you know, you, Roger Thisdell, my good friend, Katie Devaney, you know, and all of these teachers. Um, recently, I talked to, what's his name? We'll put it in the show notes. Luminous Dharma, Jason Bartlett. The fact that I can talk to these people via email the moment I have an issue with my practice is extraordinary. And the sheer volume of teachings, the the lineage credible ones and weirdos on the Dharma overground forum, <laughs> you know, alike. It's all been incredibly helpful to me, and it's just so cool it's out there. Um, no, I'm, I, I agree entirely. I mean, um, if you if you have the nose for quality teaching and quality teachers, uh, there has never been a better time yeah, for accessibility for sure. uh, between, between traditions or maybe you want to go deep in one. Um, yeah, there's never been a better time. Yeah. Oh, Locke Kelly is a heavy hitter I didn't mention. He was so useful for me. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, check out Locke Kelly, folks. He's great. Okay, um, let me pull up the audience questions. All right, no particular order. Can you both discuss your points of view on Buddhism and Hinduism's long-standing debate? Oh boy, where eternal essence can be seen either as separate or not oneness or part of one big interconnected all-pervading power of the universe, oneness. Is the latter possible, just unlikely, or has the latter been experienced as false? This question is slightly oddly phrased. Um, you know, basically, what's what's your take on the Atman Anatman <laughs> debate? <laughs> if you have a take or want to get into that, <laughs> it's time to finally end the debate. Um, <laughs> after thousands of years, we're going to settle it. <laughs> I think philosophically, I am a pragmatist and sort of a Wittgensteinian in that my tendency is to notice what I think of as language games and decide not to care about them. Um, mm, good move. <laughs> cool. So w with all respect to those traditions, um, I'm sort of a perennialist in that I feel like dedicated mystics from all traditions see roughly the same things. And so it's very interesting, right? All of these phenomena are just arising and presenting themselves and disappearing. And so you could say nothing has inherent existence based on the constant flow and flux of these things, none of which appears to leave any trace on the other if you look close enough. And you'll find no basis within your phenomenology for any of it. No, nothing solid there at all. Right. On the other hand, isn't it interesting that the appearance of this phenomenal world is so routine and that if you look close enough, it appears that there is this event horizon that is at least apparent in consciousness. Who knows whether it has some more fundamental reality. So you could point at the regularity of the appearance of phenomena and say, hey, that is an identity to which we can affix conceptual labels and speculate about cosmologically. Or you could say that's just the ongoing reference point for the flux and it is not something inherently existing. Um, this is in Tibetan Buddhism. This is the Rung Tong Shen Tong debate, um, which came up on the timeline. This is extremely esoteric, you know, like internecine, um, you know, <laughs> debate. Yeah. Um, which is it's, it's it's the same debate showing up in a Tibetan Buddhist forum. Of wait a second, okay, so does uh, the Tathagatagarbha, the you know Buddha nature, um, does it is is it self existent? Um, you know, is is the ultimate, uh, you know, non conceptual wakefulness that from a certain perspective is one's true identity is everyone's true identity. Um, mm -hmm. is that self-existent? Does that have, you know, substantial existence? And it's, you know, they're using different terms, but this is basically the same, <laughs> the, the, the same difference of opinion here. Yeah. I also find it super interesting that <clears throat> from my not particularly refined understanding of Thomistic scholastic Christianity, the sort of pops up there too, is the idea of God is the sustenance of the material world at every mm -hmm. single moment. Um, yep. And I don't know what else to say. It's cool. I find it interesting uh, 
as a debate. I don't think I'll ever have a position on it. I think Berbea style, it kind of seems different to me day to day. And they both seem like interesting ways of looking that pop up in practice uh, on their own. Um, sometimes I have real moments of, oh, wow, it feels like the phenomena is all sort of glittering snowflakes in this void. And sometimes the void and the phenomena seem more identical and thus mm -hmm. less like the void has an inherent thingness. And I don't know, man. I like, I like Mipam for, for what it's worth. And I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing his name correctly. Um, a Rime philosopher uh, from the Nyingma tradition. He attempted to reconcile <laughs> a lot of different disparate positions uh, within the Tibetan Buddhist canon. Um, and his, 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 his reconciliation, which, you know, works for me um, is that Rangtong, this kind of, uh, you know, thoroughgoing emptiness is um, from a philosophical conceptual, you know, standpoint, uh, it's the, you know, it's the safest, it's the cleanest, you know, you're, you're making the fewest errors if you go that way, just complete negation. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and yet, um, Shentong, um, this pristine, pellucid, self-existent wakefulness that manifests as the coalescence of appearance and emptiness, uh, Phenomenologically, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, that. <laughs> yeah, seems like it's there, and seems like it's a nice pointer. I mean, again, original face. Um, the Cohen tradition to me is a really moving thing in that I'm like, oh, these people from Japan five centuries ago thought it was really important that I find out about this thing, and they passed down this lineage of psychoactive poems. And some of them still work extremely well right away. Yeah. And, you know. Joshu's dog bites just as well as it did, uh, you know, when, when, when Joshu first spoke. <laughs> I've never had a moo period. Um, although it's funny, I, during my car ride, when I was trying to understand not self, uh, a phrase just kept coming to mind, which was not that, not that. And netty netty. Yeah. Seems like the same. Do you understand the power of Mu as being about that same sort of all inclusive negation? Or, yes. yeah, okay. So, uh, but I mean, if you're actually working Mu, you know, in the context of, you know, a one on one relationship with a teacher, you can't stop there. Um, that's, that's, it's not even halfway <laughs> <laughs> because you, 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 you then, um, doesn't matter how clear the recognition is if you can't then manifest it. Um, and display and act spontaneously from that um, in a kind of challenged, pressurized situation where the teacher is kind of undercutting anything that you bring. Um, if you're if if Moo is not presenting the answer, uh, then well, ring ring ring, more practice, get out. <laughs> yeah, I don't see a year of Zen monastic practice in my future. And oh, I you don't have to do it done... in the context of monasticism. I mean, you, there are koan teachers yeah. who will work with you, you know, online or, or you know, yeah, anyway. Cool. Maybe I should do that. That would be super interesting. Um, uh, I, well, I've been, rec I've been recommending Stephen Snyder's work. I could refer you to Stephen Snyder. Anyone interested in koan work, <laughs> go, go, go work with Stephen Snyder, especially if you're a lay practitioner who doesn't want to go to a monastery. That's, he, yeah. <laughs> Stephen Snyder's... I haven't engaged that deeply with his work, but um, I read some of his book on awakening. I forgot the title. Maybe you Demystifying know Demystifying Awakening? Yeah. And the thing he said about Vipassana techniques being more powerful than Zen techniques in some contexts, but Zen understanding being more complete uh, has been true of my experience. Um or Zen maps being the Zen, the Zen map of awakening as he describes it. Um, I mean, and like pop Zen maps of awakening are, well, they're that they're pop Zen maps <laughs> and pop Zen is, well, I, I, I won't say more there. Um, uh, -huh. uh, but yeah, no, I mean the awakening territory as is, as is described in the Zen tradition and as is described specifically by Stephen in some of that book. Um, you know, I've worked with Stephen one-on-one -on -one a little bit over the years and, um, yeah, very, very accurate very true to my own unfolding. So. Cool. What else? I forget where we started with that. Um, yeah. Uh, I don't know. No comment on the Atman on Atman. Oh yeah. That's where we started. <laughs> um, 
No comment other than I feel like those are both cool ways of looking and I've implemented both in my practice and they've both been fruitful. Yeah. True self, no self, uh, big self, small self, um, you know, whatever gets you there. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. Whatever works. We like pragmatism here. Um, and it's also interesting to note that in the, you know, early Buddhist suttas, nowhere does the Buddha ever says categorically, nor does he ever say categorically that no, there is no self. Absolutely. He says not self. This is not self. None of the aggregates are self. Right. Yeah, if I recall correctly, he refuses to answer the question in a rather puckish right. manner. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Were there any other questions from the internet? Yes. Um, thoughts on synchronicity? What do you think that is? What do I think synchronicity is? Just the, the phenomenon of synchronicity? Yeah, this was a very broad question. <laughs> Let me try to make sense of it. Oh, okay, no, there's a second part to this. Is, is If there is an all-pervading power that is the universe, um, is, you know, the phenomenology of synchronicity more than blind chance? Or is it just, you know, kind of uh, you're in an altered state of perception and you're, you know, seeing significance where there is, in fact, just not random, but lawfully causal events unfolding? without kind of a superordinate power orchestrating them. Again, that kind of seems like the same thing to <laughs> me. If the superordinate power that happens to arrange our consciousness is such that we encounter apparently I lost my way halfway during that sentence. Look, like if randomness is so cool that it can make those things that seem like synchronicity happen, I'm a big fan of randomness. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, I don't have anything to add there. Um, hmm. Another interesting topic would be discussing motivation, the valley people fall into when they stop using dirty fuel, how to cultivate clean fuel for motivation. I think we already touched on this in some of the shadow uh, work stuff, but is, is there anything you want to add there? Um, hmm. It actually seems relatively rare that people just lose the thread of their activities entirely. This is something that people get scared of. Um, and sometimes that happens. Henry Shukman had his notable... 25 year or so break from writing when you realize, Oh, I was just writing to short my ego. And now I can't find that thing anymore. So what am I doing? Um, no, I'm personal example. Uh, I thought after, uh, 13 months in the Zen monastery, I was going to jump into an academic career. Uh, no, <laughs> the, the basis for that dro just dropped. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, maybe there are some people working for big tobacco on the path who will stop working for big tobacco or something. Um, I found that there was a more gradual and quite pleasant titration where most of my activities are similar. Uh, I liked writing before and I like it now. I think I come at it from a slightly less self-centered perspective, but I still like when people like me because I write things. Um, that doesn't seem bad. That's just more liking in the world. Um, you know, I don't dress in robes now. I still think presenting myself in a somewhat polished way can be skillful in social situations. Oh, I think you need I a funny know. hat, Sasha. You definitely need a funny hat with tassels, bright colors. Okay. Well, if you can refer <laughs> me to one of those, uh, as well as our good one teacher, I would, I would appreciate it. Um, <laughs> um, and I, I donate to charity a little more. I think I'm a little more pleasant to people, but. Um, I think when people go through violent experiences, and I mean violent in a good way, self-other boundary breakdown and stream entry-ish things, part of the ego's grasping onto that is the idea that you will be completely changed. And it, it usually doesn't seem to be the case. I, there were two weeks after a big early spiritual experience for me um, during the shadow work period where I just didn't know what to do with my life, but it was about two weeks. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. All right. That, that kind of covers as well. Some of the next couple of questions. Um, 
should you do something rather than nothing? That's a false dichotomy. Um, yeah. I don't know. You want to speak to that? Both. Um, well, it touches on one of my pet subjects. So let me take this opportunity to ride my hobby horse around a bit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I will uh, gladly entertain it. Go on. I think um, one thing I've said before, and I will say again, is I want inner work from my outer work friends and outer work from my inner work friends. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. I feel like one pet peeve of mine is I meet people who are super awake or have had really interesting healing experiences, but they're pretty bad at things like running a company or management <laughs> or um, dealing with conflict skillfully. And their skill with the inner stuff blinds them apparently to the fact that they suck at other yep. stuff. Um, yep. Yep. Being a great Which manager, is what a teacher is for and living in a community for what it's worth. You know, that's the traditional role of, you know, <laughs> mutual polishing as it's called in Zen. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, some people could use more of that. And I think for realized people or people who are having these profound experiences, it might be really interesting to say, oh, can I be effective in the world with this smooth, polished mind I have now? That might be interesting to to find out similarly Bring your gifts I, to the marketplace you know don't don't yeah. stay up on the mountain the world yeah. um hello <laughs> yeah. yeah 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 take a look around completely <laughs> similarly um i have very 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 high achieving friends uh who are totally wonderful where i'm like bro if you just did six months of lot kelly practice this personal problem that's been plaguing your entire life would would more or less dissolve or at least be attenuated to some degree. And um, so I think if you're doing a lot of something, consider doing nothing. If you're doing nothing, consider <laughs> something. I've heard Shinzen say almost exactly the same thing using different words. So yes, yeah, that. that. <laughs> cool. Um, yeah. Well, I've run out of questions from the audience. Um, if, I've, if I've missed anything that someone put in, um, apologies. Uh, this may happen again sometime or, you know, yeah. Cool. Um, you're going to have to decide all this for yourself anyway. So, uh, do you have any more questions following our, our discussion? How, how is it right now? Like at this moment or today? Yeah. Um, um like right now. <laughs> great. Feels spontaneous, pleasurable. Um, <sighs> It is interesting to be at a moment of practice where I'm looking for the nugget. You know, I'm looking for the thing that's going to make it all 100% definitively kind of click into place. Not, not re being done in general, because I don't believe in that as, as you don't, but this part of the insight journey and all of the teachers I talk to, including you, are like, yep, almost there, bro. With nothing else to do. Just keep doing it. And <laughs> it, is a, it is a totally beautiful and really confounding part. It is really beautiful and confounding to have days and days of radical wholeness and complete acceptance. And then to fall out of that and be like, how did I even fall out of that? What? Fall out of what? Yeah. Who's falling out of it? What do I do? Yep. Is there doing yep. anything? <laughs> <laughs> no, there's just seeing that clearer and clearer day by day, moment by moment until eventually. Yeah. Yeah. No, y'all have been very charitable with your, your time. I talked to you about this and I talked to Frank Yang about this who, um, man, he's, I love his content. One-to-one -one, he's quite different. He's just a very chill and kind person, but he's very fun to talk to about practice. And you guys just keep saying the same thing, which is annoying. Of like, you get it. Isn't that horrible? <laughs> you get it. Just get it. Just get it a tiny bit more. Could you? Could you just, just a little bit. Just a little bit more. Just... Yeah. 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 It's fun. It's fun. I... I suspect if the earth continues, I will look back on this time of confusion with some degree of nostalgia. Yeah. Maybe. 
There you go. Not knowing things again. <laughs> Not knowing is most intimate, as they say. Mm. I will remember that when I sit down later and I'm confused. No, there's this there's this great, I mean, you know, Bodhidharma, right? Just famous for staring at a wall for nine years. You know, just just sit there. Like a bundle of rags, like a corpse. What a relief. <laughs> This has been a great conversation. Yeah, likewise. Lots of fun. Um, where where should I direct people to go? I'll put links in the, the show notes, um, but here at the end, you can say it verbally as well. Um, my sub stack, I guess. Uh, there's my first name and last name dot com, which has links to my activities, services, and products. Um, you can find me on Twitter. Unfortunately, <laughs> sometimes, unfortunately, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I do things, you know, I have a website, but folks, I'm on Twitter. You can, you can find me there. I'm trying to be less on Twitter. Um, we'll see. <laughs> yeah. Twitter has a way of warming its way back in there. Uh, yeah. All right, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. I hope this conversation has been helpful. Um, amusing. At least one of those. And if not, eh, we tried. <laughs> cool. <laughs> okay. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.